As a lifeguard, you are trained in the recovery procedures in dealing with an unconscious victim, be it a surface rescue or a rescue from the bottom of the pool. In both instances, the recovery procedures are the same. Get the victim to the surface and out of the water as quickly as possible in order to effectively perform CPR or other life-sustaining treatment. There is, however, one set of circumstances that dictates a drastically different approach to the rescue and that is when dealing with a scuba diving emergency. The use of compressed air for breathing underwater introduces one variable which makes this type of emergency totally different from all the others. First, some very simplified facts as to the laws of pressure. In the atmosphere in which we exist, we are surrounded by a pressure of approximately 15 pounds per square inch. So no matter whether you are affecting a rescue on a drowned swimmer on the surface or the bottom of the pool, the swimmer will only have 15 pounds per square inch of air in their lungs, and nothing you do in the rescue procedure can cause the swimmer any further harm. But let's study the additional variable of the weight of water and how it affects the scuba diver. Approximately every 12 inches of water in any water column adds an additional one half pound of pressure to the atmospheric pressure you are breathing right at this very moment. So accepting the fact that the depth of the water in the deep end of most swimming pools in the city is 14 feet deep, with some simple mathematics we can calculate what pressure we will encounter at the bottom. 14 times 1 half equals 7, plus the 15 pounds which exist at the surface, making a total of 22 pounds per square inch. Now, here is the part which puts a scuba diving victim in a totally different category than a swimming victim. As a result of the diver breathing compressed air, the pressure inhaled on every single breath is identical to the surrounding pressure. So unlike the swimming victim, who was breathing 15 pounds per square inch of air prior to the emergency, the scuba diver was breathing 22 pounds per square inch right up to the very last breath before their unfortunate demise. This means that while the scuba diver is lying on the bottom of the pool, the 22 pounds per square inch of pressurized air still remains in the lungs and airways, even though the diver is unconscious. It isn't until the diver ascends that this pressurized air escapes. In a normal ascent, every scuba diver is taught very early in the certification process that slow ascents are critical to their safety. A normal respiration rate is all that is needed to allow the excess air to escape but our unconscious diver has no way of monitoring these important breathing techniques. If the victim were suddenly brought to the surface without allowing the internal 22 pounds per square inch of pressure to escape, on reaching the surface, the external 7 pounds per square inch of water pressure will now have been removed from the equation. This would mean that the excess pressure in the lungs would have to escape somewhere. Another law of physics dictates that when any gas escapes from any vessel, it will always take the path of least resistance. In this case, the weakest area is in the alveolar structure of the lungs. Approximately two cells of body tissue is all that separates the air we breathe from our bloodstream. And it is this fact which dictates where the pressurized air in our lungs will escape. The resulting injury to the diver will either be a mediastinal emphysema, subcutaneous emphysema, a pneumothorax, or in the worst case scenario, an air embolism resulting in the diver's death. So in what way does the lifeguard affect a safe rescue and recovery of an unconscious diver? Initially, the procedure is the same in making contact with the diver. But then the previous discussion on the pressurized air in the diver's lungs must be at the forefront of the lifeguard's mind. It will be most likely the diver is in a face-down position on the bottom of the pool. The most important part of the recovery is maintaining an open airway. This is controlled by the lifeguard's right hand under the diver's chin. If allowed, the head of the unconscious diver will fall forward, closing the diver's airway. So this must not be allowed to happen. Then, with the lifeguard's left hand on the diver's tank valve, the unconscious person is rolled into an upright, head-up position. Over the years, I have heard many suggestions as to attempting to replace the diver's regulator in their mouth, and this may somehow assist in the rescue. Unless the diver were to spontaneously regain consciousness when rolled into an upright position, trying to replace a regulator in an unconscious diver's mouth will result in no more than wasted time. An unconscious diver in no way possesses the ability to use the regulator effectively, 
and pressing the front purge button on the regulator would only result in forcing more water into the victim's lungs. Every diver's buoyancy control jacket has a power inflator unit located at the left-hand side of the buoyancy control jacket. There are many cosmetic differences between the individual manufacturer's products, but all have two buttons, one of which, usually on the side or front of the unit, sends compressed air into the jacket. So maintaining head-up position with the lifeguard's right hand, the left hand can be utilized to inflate the jacket, giving the diver positive buoyancy. If the lifeguard were to experience difficulty in finding the correct button, then obviously they would resort to leg power, swimming the diver to the surface while kicking. But as long as the diver's airway is kept open, the expanding air pressure from the lungs would escape through the bronchial passages on ascent, doing no harm whatsoever to the victim. On reaching the surface, the lifeguard is now assisted by the fact that the diver has a high degree of positive buoyancy. Keeping the diver in a face-up position and concentrating on the diver's nose and mouth being clear of the water, the victim can be easily brought to the side of the pool where additional help from the pool deck can be utilized. Before pulling the victim from the water, removing the diver's weight system is the first priority. This can either be in the form of a weight belt or in some buoyancy control units, the weight system could be attached to the side pockets. Once these weights have been removed and allowed to sink to the bottom of the pool, the buoyancy control unit and tank can then be jettisoned. Most common in today's modern diving equipment is the front adjustable buoyancy control unit, where unclipping the front straps allows the tank and jacket to float free of the diver. If any difficulty were experienced in this part of the rescue, a sharp knife would suffice. From this point forward, the emergency skills are identical to any other water-related emergency in treating an unconscious drowning victim. Hopefully, we have brought to your attention the important differences which exist between the scuba diving rescue and recovery and all others. If all else fails, remember the one single most important fact. Keep the airway open on ascent. <laughs>